session. Uh, so thank you, Irina. As you will have seen, we're recording the session for the benefit of uh, people who can't make it at this time. Uh, so my thanks to those who've joined. So this is a session that's being organized uh, within the Oceania, Oceania slash East Asia region uh, with the title Collaborating Internationally for Regional Benefit, which is a very broad title. Um, and the way we constructed this particular session was we wanted to do two things. We wanted to look at a range of open science platforms. And so we have speakers from Korea, Japan, and Malaysia talking about their open science initiatives. But we also wanted to situate that within the broader question of the care principles as they relate, particularly within our region. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, the first speaker, uh, Dr. Riley Taitingfong, will both uh, will provide us with a, a perspective on care principles uh, and a background to them for people who are unfamiliar with them. Uh, and then we'll uh, proceed to look at open science platforms from Korea, Japan, and Malaysia. And I've asked the speakers there to, um, to talk a little bit about how they're thinking about issues of indigenous data governance uh, within the, the design of their platforms. So let me start with uh, Dr. Taiting Fong. Um, uh, she's a researcher and educator, specifically looking at issues of environmental justice, indigenous self-determination, emerging technologies and community engagement. Uh, she completed a PhD in communication from the University of California, San Diego, where she, her project focused on indigenous governance of genetic engineering technologies known as gene drives. And for my Australian colleagues, uh, we have a, a related, well, no, we have a similar project that uh, is taking place at the ANU. Uh, Riley is currently a postdoctoral researcher with UDAL and the Native Nations Institute, working on the implementation of care principles of indigenous data governance within data repositories, which is something we're also looking at here in Australia. Um, she's a Chamorro uh, researcher. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the Chamorro, um, you might know it as the, the region that includes both Guam and Northern Mariana, so way out in, in, in the Pacific. And as someone from that background, she's committed to building cross-movement solidarity among Indigenous communities from Oceania to Turtle Island. I confess I do not know where Turtle Island is. I'll go and look that up now. Um, but uh, Dr. Taiting Fong, the, the floor and indeed the screen is yours. Thanks very much, Andrew. Appreciate it. Buenas and half a day, Torres Hamzu, Guahusi Riley, Taiting Fong. As Andrew shared, my name is Riley. And oops, excuse me. Um, I am pleased to join you all today and have a chance to uh, talk about the care principles for Indigenous data governance. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I'll take a few minutes to kind of situate us into some shared concepts around Indigenous data sovereignty, Indigenous data governance, and introduce us to the care principles. Um, and then I'll close the presentation with just a brief mention of a handful of the projects that we're working on at the University of Arizona and in some of our collaborations. So um, let me jump into it. All right. So when we talk about Indigenous data sovereignty, um, we really like to start with the key message that Indigenous peoples have always been data experts, right? And so on this slide, uh, maybe you recognize some of the images here. These are a series of different kinds of physical mechanisms that indigenous peoples from around uh, Turtle Islands so or the continental US and the Pacific have used since time immemorial to store and transmit and preserve and share information uh, from their knowledge systems. And so from left going clockwise, uh, this is an autumn uh, calendar stick. Uh, mm -hmm. The picture with the ocean in the background. This is a Marshallese stick chart. This is from Micronesia. So the neck of the woods where my people are from in the great Pacific Ocean. Um, this is something that's used by navigators to map out uh, waves and currents and atolls. And then going to the right, this is um, a winter count. And then at the bottom, this is um, a stellar instrument that sits atop Mauna Loa on Mokuokeave or the big island of Hawaii. And so 
bees and many other mechanisms have long been used by indigenous peoples to record information um, from their scientific practices, right? And this kind of um, storage and transmission of information has always been uh, safeguarded and done through indigenous peoples protocols and practices for the care of their knowledge systems, right? So whether through physical mechanisms, oral mechanisms, and today, as we think about data moving through digital ecosystems, uh, really what's at the heart of indigenous data sovereignty is thinking about the protocols indigenous peoples have for the care of their knowledge systems and their relations, and really embedding that into technology, into data ecosystems, and into institutional policy. And so now to put a few kind of finer points and definitions on some terms that are relevant for us. So um, what are indigenous data? Uh, when we talk about indigenous data, we're really referring to any data, information, knowledges in any format that impact indigenous peoples, nations, and communities, both at the collective and at individual levels. So this can include data about um, indigenous peoples' non-human relations. So environmental data, uh, data about plants and animals and lands. This also includes data about indigenous peoples as individuals. So for example, administrative, legal, health, social information and more. And this includes information about indigenous people as collectives. So um, thinking about traditional and cultural information, languages, knowledge systems, and more. And so then what is indigenous data sovereignty, or as I'll say for shorthand, IDSOV? IDSOV is really the right of indigenous peoples and nations to govern the collected, collection, ownership, and application of their own data. And so um, again, IDSOV is grounded in the inherent rights of indigenous peoples to self-determine how uh, their lands and resources are used. It also has, as I mentioned, its genesis really in the traditions, the roles, responsibilities, the protocols indigenous peoples hold for the use of their information. IDSOV is also positioned within a human rights framework, um, as well as different kinds of treaties, court cases and other legal and extra legal mechanisms. So um, for example, with um, IDSOV and the care principles, we often invoke UNDRIP or the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And then finally, IDSOV also underscores that knowledge belongs to the collective and is fundamental to who we are as Indigenous peoples. Okay, so if indigenous data sovereignty is really about indigenous people's rights to determine the use of their data from collection to use and reuse, indigenous data governance is about the specific mechanisms put in place to uphold those rights. And we also like to acknowledge that indigenous data governance happens at multiple different uh, kind of scales and levels. So at a sort of broad international or global scale, there's different kinds of principles such as the care principles for indigenous data governance, which we're all gonna talk about today. And then at the level of um, geographic regions, you have different frameworks such as uh, the principles for Maori data sovereignty out of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and also OCAP uh, or um, ownership control access and possession, which is out of a First Nations uh, Canada context. And then finally, at um, sort of the most localized scale, of course, specific indigenous nations, tribes, communities have their own various frameworks, policies, protocols for the governance of their data. And now to say a bit about the genesis of the CARE principles for indigenous data governance. So the creation of CARE um, is really an effort undertaken by um, a group of indigenous and allied scholars going back to an RDA gathering in Botswana in 2018. Uh, these scholars and leaders came together and were interested in kind of understanding what are some of the main uh, differences between mainstream data principles, for example, the FAIR principles and others, um, and indigenous people's own principles for the care of their data. And so something that they found in drawing these comparisons was, was that uh, mainstream data principles tended to be more data-centric, right? Focused on the information itself. 
whereas indigenous people's principles tended to be very people and purpose oriented. And so this is where the impetus for the creation of the care principles come from, is really in an effort to sow the people and purpose orientation back into data principles. And so the care principles for indigenous data governance include C for collective benefit. And this is about ensuring that data ecosystems um, really enable indigenous peoples to derive benefit from the use of their data. A, which we really see as the heart of the care principles stands for authority to control. And this is about indigenous peoples rights and interests to their data and making sure that their authority to control how their data are used uh, is upheld across various data ecosystems and institutions interacting with their data. R stands for responsibility. And so this is about um, upholding the responsibility to share how indigenous data are used and to support indigenous people's self-determination and collective benefit. And then finally, E, ethics has to do with indigenous people's rights and well-being, sort of being centered at all stages of the data life cycle and across the data ecosystem. And one thing to note, if uh, the care principles are new to you, uh, you can check out the publications by Stephanie Carroll and colleagues um, on the original uh, sharing of the care principles and also check out the GITA Global Indigenous Data Alliance website where the care principles are hosted and there's um, a great set of resources there to check out as well. Okay, and so I want to close uh, by just mentioning briefly um, just a handful of projects that I'm co-leading through my postdoc and working on with others through the Global Indigenous Data Alliance and the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance. I'm really happy to say more about these in the Q&A and also point you to other places that you can look to learn more about these projects. So uh, the first is the care data maturity model. And so this is something that I'm leading through my postdoc. We're developing an assessment tool, uh, really drawing inspiration from the fair data maturity model to yeah. create something that, um, you know, end users across universities, data repositories, funding agencies, data, um, excuse me, uh, um, publishers, journals, and others can use to evaluate indigenous data governance in their setting. Uh, the second bullet here is the, something that we're calling phase zero, which is really about concrete steps to build a foundation for uh, care implementation and for indigenous data governance in your setting. And so we've uh, put together a consortium or a partnership of uh, folks working with indigenous data across a number of data repositories to kind of understand their own practices, their challenges that arrive in, arise in implementing care and um, are creating a sort of phased framework for care implementation that will result in a, a peer reviewed publication in the months to come. Okay, and then finally, I wanna mention the uh, US IDSOV and IDGov summit that we hosted just last month in Tucson. We gathered about 500 people in person and another um, 150 or so participants online for this summit. It was the first of its kind in the US and really had great conversations about how to advance indigenous data sovereignty in the United States. And as part of this really um, focusing on how we can be sure to include the US territories, including Guam, including Puerto Rico, um, and also including tribes that might not have state or federal recognition uh, in the conversation uh, about IDSOV and in specifically um, an effort to create a national standard for indigenous data sovereignty in the US. And so in the months to come, we'll be putting out a communique from this engagement. And uh, you can see more there, including uh, some of the key takeaways from the round table that we hosted about what we hope to see for building IDSOV in the US territories. All righty, so I'll go ahead and leave it there. I wanna say a big sign of say thank you uh, to RDA and to Andrew for the invitation to join this convening and just acknowledge the many uh, folks who partner and, and support this work. Great, thank you very much for that, uh, that excellent overview, Riley. Um,
So we now move to a uh, series of presentations, which, as I said, are from uh, different organizations within the region that are seeking to manage data. Uh, and uh, I'd like to start by turning to Korea uh, and introducing uh, Dr. Jung Ho Um uh, from the Department of Computer Intelligence Research at the Korean Institute for Scientific and Technical Information. Um, he is leading a team within KISTI, which is how that what that acronym is, uh, that's developing the data on um, portal uh, and the data on uh, the underpinning data repository. Um, he has a PhD in computer engineering uh, from Chonbuk National University in South Korea. Uh, and uh, Dr. Um, if you would like to share your screen and explain what's happening in Korea, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, you need to, but on, not in presentation mode. We see the oh. the the little screenshots as well, the little um, thumbnails as well. Perfect. Thank you. Oh. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jung Oh, uh, I'm uh, working on KISTI. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about uh, Korean approach to open science platforms, uh, including any applications of care principles. Uh, today's presentation, I'd like to focusing, focus on research uh, data platform. And I, I studied uh, care principles and I mapped the um, data on functions to uh, care principles uh, in, uh, in my personal way, but I'm not sure it is the right way to categorize. Well, let's, uh, let's discuss about the uh, better uh, presentation of my time. Okay, I, first of all, I, I'd like to introduce our data on uh, Korean research data uh, integration platform, and I uh, overview of data functionalities and uh, some. Uh, I will show you about the, some example of data on with uh, care principles related to care principles, and I'd like to uh, talk about the future direction of data on. 2018, the government of the Republic of Korea announced a new strategy uh, about research data sharing and utilization. Uh, in this strategy, uh, they propose national level of research data platform, which provides gathering and discovering research data and uh, providing the infrastructure for analyzing research data. And it also, uh, Includes uh, it uh, involves uh, the highlight for collecting research data produced by national R and D projects uh, by shown in this figure. So, uh, motivating this strategy, uh, data on uh, research data platform is developed and uh, has been open since January two thousand twenty. I'd like to show more detail about the data on uh, functionalities. Uh, the main uh, functionality of data on is uh, uh, consists of creating research data and searching research data and resources and uh, providing data analytics service for uh, individual researchers. Uh, first, agree for aggregating research data, uh, the researchers can submit research data into data on directory. And also, uh, we try to collect research data from uh, governments, uh, research institutes, and uh, universities. Uh, for this, we developed our own data repository software, uh, NARDA. Uh, it is an uh, institutional data repository uh, used in uh, Korea. And uh, First, in, at the first stage, we uh, collect uh, research data from other uh, famous 
and uh, overseas research data repository platform such as ARDC, Japan IRDB, and OpenAir, uh, Finland, and New Zealand, and Harbor Dataverse, and so on. After uh, gathering of that, so we uh, give the some uh, uh, <coughs> such such functionality uh, by using uh, collected research data and resources. We have uh, research data sets and uh, the table figure uh, data from uh, Korean National R and D reports and. We have some software information from our uh, data analytics service. And also, uh, we uh, provide a small uh, infrastructure for uh, individual researchers. Uh, they can uh, draw and uh, make uh, some program uh, by using a, a visualized workflow environment. And also, they can uh, draw or programming the programming in uh, Jupyter Lab uh, environments in Python. Uh, okay, so our main uh, goal of data is provide various domestic and overseas research data. So we collected uh, 1.89 uh, million uh, metadata uh, and uh, we collect data set uh, about 40,000 uh, data sets and 21 uh, repositories interconnected in to data. So from these repositories, we collect uh, research data. And uh, this right side of this table shows about interconnected external uh, services and operating institution in uh, South Korea. So uh, I'd like to summarize our data on uh, features. Uh, I already explained correcting and submission such uh, functionalities. For analytics uh, functionalities, we provide uh, application and visualize workflow called Canvas. And also we provide Jupyter to uh, connect with uh, programming environment, we uh, provide some personal strategy service uh, to the individual uh, researchers. For the data community, we provide the communication boards uh, to, uh, in this board, they can uh, post and sharing research data uh, with community members. And, uh, the lack of infrastructure, uh, the uh, researchers who has lack of infrastructure, we, we provide uh, some hosting service for, uh, especially to uh, institutional data repository, Narada. So uh, this is, this figure shows the how collects uh, the research data from uh, Narada or IDR uh, to data on. Uh, the researchers can submit the data and archiving uh, data, then uh, the Narada can uh, submit some metadata to uh, data on. Uh, data on also collecting uh, from Narada, also uh, collect the raw data from researchers, then defining the data. And then uh, they, uh, the users can uh, search the metadata after that. Uh, they, the users go to landing page on uh, their own data repository. So, um, so I very briefly uh, summarize and uh, introduce our data on service and. After that, I met uh, some data on uh, very specific uh, functionalities into care principles. Uh, for, the, for the collective benefits, uh, we uh, collect the research data and after that, we categorize uh, research data into national science and technology standard classification for the uh, collective benefits, I think. 
uh, so uh, if research data from overseas platform at that time uh, we classify by the uh, subject fields uh, manually so we map to uh, Korean national science and technology standard classification so uh, user can uh, search the this category you just uh, can use these categories to uh, search your uh, retrieval of uh, research data. And we are uh, going to reach, uh, we are going to do some uh, function, uh, designing the uh, functionality to bridge data provider with uh, bridging uh, between data provider and consumers. For the authority to control, uh, as I told you about previous slides, uh, after searching metadata and then uh, downloading such data or raw data, uh, it is uh, occurred to only the data repository. And we give some communication board to com uh, for the individual community and we uh, uh, provide differential authority for opening research data. Um, metadata is open to all, but downloading raw data is to only granted users in uh, data on system. Uh, the, this figure shows about the landing page uh, in the uh, our data, research data. Uh, in uh, data on system. For the uh, responsibility, uh, we when we submit the metadata fields, uh, we provide uh, primary and sub language. And uh, uh, when submitting the data, uh, so we provide the detecting the sensitive data by recognizing data patterns. Yeah, and uh, okay, uh, finally, I'd like to uh, uh, present about the future direction of data on. We now on uh, discussing about new strategies, uh, both uh, considering both research security and uh, open science. Uh, we, uh, when we survey the uh, Korean researchers, they very worried about research security. So it is uh, really be very hard, harder to uh, get uh, open data and uh, makes, uh, making uh, open science campaign. And so uh, systematically, we integrate research data sharing platform and uh, research analytics environment sharing system, um, KRDC. Uh, so uh, we not only the gathering the research data, we also uh, plan to sharing the uh, research uh, in infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the listening my talk and this all my uh, presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's a note in chat saying that if people's slides are available online, uh, if they could add them to the collaborative notes document as well, um, so that we can refer to the slides later, that would be very helpful. I've just put the link to the collaborative notes in the, the chat um, uh, to, to assist with that. And please, if people would like to take their own notes, uh, there is that collaborative notes document. Uh, and if you haven't yet put your um, contact details in, that would also be very helpful. Uh, so thank you to Dr. Um. Uh, I should, ex should have explained at the start that we're planning to have a series of presentations to set the scene, uh, and then we'll have a, uh, a panel discussion with Q&A from the audience. So we'll move through the, the presentations and then, then move into the discussion. Um, so, uh, the second speaker uh, is Mikiko Tanafuji, um, 
who's the Deputy Director of the Research Centre for Open Science and the Data Platform at the National Institute of Informatics, NII, uh, which is providing a research data cloud to all of the science sectors in Japan, uh, covers data management, publishing, and open access. Um, NII is a research data infrastructure centre in Japan, uh, and it collaborates outside Japan as well with uh, EOS crew um, in Europe, uh, other regions, and is working to build this globally interoperable open science community. Uh, Mikiko uh, has particular expertise in research data infrastructure and uh, the publishing sector, and I've managed to lose my mouse. There we go. Um, responsible for international collaborations uh, and working on distributing the concept of a research data commons. And given that this is a research data alliance plenary, I should say that uh, she has been a member of the Research Data Alliance Council uh, for one whole month now. Um, so given that she given that she is so busy, we are very grateful that she's found the time to join us. So Makiko, please talk to us thank about you, uh, the Japanese approach. Thank you very much, Andrew. And thank you for being with my long CV. <laughs> Uh, hello everyone, it's Mikiko Tanifuji, and only one month student to RDA council member. Um, it's uh, my great honor to be uh, invited to this uh, session is because I believe that the indigenous data issue is not yet an uh, active topic in open science world, in uh, open science in Japan. And uh, not because of their ant research, but they are, but not yet uh, joining in the sort of level of the indigenous data with care principles uh, expectation that introduced at the beginning of this session. Um, however, I um, would like to share of, uh, my thoughts and with uh, open science platform point of view. First, um, the NII, where I work for, uh, provide a research data cloud, the so-called NII LDC. And uh, normally, uh, in the most of our presentation in the world, you may have heard uh, research data management, Gakunin LDM, which is closed uh, environment for research projects in each university or research institute. And uh, as a, when they want to publish as a research outcome, and then they can use research, uh, research data institutional repository, so-called Jiro Cloud. And so from closed data to be published on the repository, there is a uh, quite uh, important some functions like I introduced in the seven new features. Uh, for example, for today's topic, uh, data governance is one of perhaps the most important uh, functions for indigenous data. Even they are not, uh, researchers are not yet really joining and using the data governance, but I quite sure that this data governance will be very useful and perhaps helpful to make research data as a fairable research data. And also uh, another part of the interoperability is important to uh, research with data curation. And the data curation is also new to indigenous data, but surely it will be very uh, useful. So other uh, five functions, we pr uh, provide protection with secure computation uh, cluster. And also uh, we are very uh, interested and committed to universities in particular to provide training course for people who will be eventually come to the important players in open science world, such as uh, research data management, how to manage the research data, and what will be the very good tips if you want to reuse uh, with together with your colleagues 
And those are the uh, materials for education system. We provide an infrastructure for e-learning and also helping uh, materials to produce, to be able to share the uh, e-learning courses itself. And of course, we provide secure storage environment and also uh, data provenance, which is a rather new discussion in Japan because uh, most of the time that researchers are not really aware of uh, archiving the information where the data come from and where data export to. Re researchers mostly know that when they get published as articles and then they can surely provide evidence data, but the, uh, the process that they reach to the point is digitized as a digitized information uh, to uh, link to the research data is uh, we call data provenance. And perhaps data provenance also will be very helpful for indigenous data as well. So those uh, seven uh, functions, uh, we are uh, almost half of it uh, coming to the own service and the rest are still uh, designing or discussing with research communities. Now, I would like to move on to uh, indigenous research as examples in Japan. And one of perhaps a uh, well-known is the uh, Ainu culture as an indigenous people's uh, history, culture, and also uh, other knowledge such as uh, nature and environment. And that sort of information are so far not yet come to our open science platform. But there are research ongoing and we hope to that they join us. In other uh, indigenous research, uh, they are also disaster management, not particularly necessarily connected to Ainu, just in the general research topics there are disaster management such as indigenous knowledge is useful in the field of disaster management against to the natural disasters. And traditional folk beliefs or techniques and faith from different parts of Japan are often used for disaster management. And the other example is environmental protection and symbiosis is that the impact on non-native species and habitat development for diverse or organisms are uh, also, I believe that as a indigenous research can be uh, shared on the platform. And the regional development such as enhance the vitality of the region, there are also research activities in Japan. So if I fit all the examples I just mentioned to the open science platform, as I mentioned that management, uh, how to manage the business data with proper data governance, and perhaps most of the case, uh, the research is pursued by the data management plan together with research funds, will be uh, quite important to link to care principles once they started to join the open science. So if I describe this part of the relationship in more detail from platform point of view, uh, open science platform surely aims to long-term inheritable culture platforms with appropriate data management, as I mentioned, research data management with data governance which comply with care principles. And uh, I draw here the relationship between research data policy or any guideline provided by the Institute would cooperate with data governance on the system. And this data, that data governance will uh, link to the data management plans. So once the indigenous data research, uh, re indigenous research uh, work with research data on this data management plan, and then all data and information will be stored in the same platform like we already provide. 
So I believe that applications, any applications of care principles will be uh, quite seamlessly and also uh, usefully uh, connect uh, work on this open science platform. And the last uh, slide, which I would like to mention that the uniqueness of uh, indigenous research data is that uh, this is a screenshot from a National Diet Library in Japan. And if I search Ainu research, and there are over 7,000 literature uh, archive in National Diet Library. However, most of them are prints. So in the future, it will be uh, good if they could uh, digitization on those uh, important literatures into digital way and together with metadata so that uh, we can utilizing those uh, important the indigenous data fair, as available data and applications. That would be a quite interesting area as introduced at the beginning of this session today. And um, we are very interested in see the future of indigenous research data. So thank you very much for listening and hoping to uh, bring some uh, aspect from one of the Asian countries. Thank you very much, Mikiko. Uh, so we now turn to our last presentation uh, from Professor Nur Sada Abdurrahman, uh, who has a background in uh, chemistry, organic chemistry, it looks like from her CV. Um, she uh, was the director of, for the Institute of Research Management and Monitoring uh, from 2006 to 2014, uh, and officially retired from the University of Malaya in 2021. Uh, she's been actively involved with the Malaysian Academy of Sciences since 2014 uh, and has recently been appointed a Fellow of the World Academy of Science. And importantly, in this context, she chairs the Malaysian Open Science Alliance uh, that oversees the implementation of the Malaysian Open Science Platform that you'll talk to us about um, today. Um, in April 2023, she was elected as the Secretary General of the Malaysian Academy of Sciences. Uh, she has a research interest, an ongoing research interest in drug discovery and synthesis, uh, particularly in looking for compounds that might be bioactive against the dengue virus, which is a particularly unpleasant tropical disease. Um, and she's also one of the uh, pillar chairs in the National Planetary Health Action Plan Committee. She does many, many other things. It, it makes me feel quite, uh, quite tired looking at the long list of things that she's involved in, uh, which including raising the interest in chemistry among school children, which is wonderful. Um, but today she's talking to us about her work with the Malaysian Open Science Platform. Uh, Professor Ahman, up to you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, good afternoon, or good morning, or evening, wherever you are in the world. But uh, thank you very much for uh, you know inviting me to share um, the initiative that we have in Malaysia on um, open science. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, Malaysian Open Science uh, Initiative is actually relatively new. Oh, how do I? Okay. Uh, um, if we compare to, you know, um, many other um, nations around the world. So, but um, our objective is to gather and consolidate research data in Malaysia onto one platform that allow access and sharing of research data, which is aligned to the FAIR principles. We realized, uh, you know, um, quite late, I presume, that, you know, this data that uh, we've done uh, research on are slowly uh, disappearing as, uh, you know, researchers, um, uh, you know, retire or leave uh, the institu institution and, you know, the data that they have gathered uh, just uh, disappear uh, with them. So, uh, you know, this is one uh, major initiative that was done to ensure that, you know, we keep all this data uh, available. So this is actually aligned to the government uh, policy on uh, uh, the national science policy of te uh, on technology, science, technology, and innovation under the strategy Y, which is a strategy two, uh, looking at the trust for Malaysian open science platform. So this was actually done in uh, the initiative that we started actually uh, was in uh, 2019. Uh, so if you look at the Malaysian open science journey, 
we did actually um, look into data management uh, and data curation uh, early on uh, in 2009, between 2015 to 2019, when, uh, as I mentioned, uh, universities realized that, you know, their researchers and their professors retire and the, the data has uh, gone missing. So uh, we embarked on this um, uh, research collaboration um, in terms of uh, study work with the British Council to look into how to actually manage data and curate the data and actually put them in data repository. At the same time, uh, the uh, Malaysian Academy of Sciences actually participated in the APAC meeting which discussed open science in the APAC community. So in uh, when they came back in 2018, uh, you know, and um, we formed a consortia, uh, you know, comprising of uh, members from the uh, Academy of Sciences and also the universities that were involved uh, to form a Malaysian Open Science Alliance to look at an initiative on how open science can be carried out in, in Malaysia. So uh, the Open Science uh, Alliance was launched in 2019 that oversees the, uh, you know, um, the uh, Open Science Initiative in Malaysia and the first phase of Open Science Initiative began in 2020, when um, our cabinet uh, approved on a uh, science paper in August. And with this, we started working on uh, uh, um, you know, um, uh, the open science uh, platform that we were going to put uh, in place. The Alliance member com originally, or originally comprised of nine members, but now we are in phase two. Uh, we have increased the alliance member, um, you know, to actually look into this. The Malaysian Open Science uh, Alliance actually <clears throat> is a steering committee that actually uh, ensure that the activities on the um, open science is being carried out and how it's being carried out. Um, but we have other members now uh, uh, that we actually form into um, what we call MOSNET, or Malaysian Open Science Network where you know, members can come in and we have other activities that we actually carried out um, to help uh, you know, other members from Malaysia institutions and researchers to be aware and actually be involved in the Open Science Initiative and share their data. So the first phase uh, of Open Science uh, that we actually carried out started in 2020, as I mentioned, originally supposed to start in 2019, uh, but because of the COVID, it was delayed for about it's a two-year initiative, but it was delayed for about two years as well. So finally, the proper initiative began in 2021. Uh, we were supposed to actually first come up with an open science guideline, a national guideline that uh, hopefully looks into how the national, uh, you know, researcher, the researchers actually deposit, uh, you know, their uh, research output and data into a national repository. Um, we also realized very, very quickly that, you know, we don't have... Um, people who can actually manage the data, curate the data. So we actually need to actually um, build capacity for data stewardship um, and uh, also increase the awareness amongst the researchers of the importance of how to actually uh, manage data and uh, data management plan. And uh, the last thing that, uh, and the most important one is to actually look at infrastructure on uh, one uh, integrated uh, database on one platform. So we were able to do this uh, national guideline, uh, which uh, is available now on the web for you know members. Uh, we were able to build uh, uh, some capacity and actually train about 261 uh, data stewards from all over the institution uh, in Malaysia. These 261, um, I think about 40% of them are librarians, uh, sorry, 60% of them are librarians and 40% a uh, uh, research officer from the various institutions in Malaysia. And um, now we are embarking on a, a second uh, uh, training session. So do we call this uh, data steward uh, training 1.0 and we have a, a data stewardship uh, training 2.0, which actually now look at the content in terms of uh, you know the various discipline like uh, biology, chemistry, and um, physics, et cetera, because we realize that, um, you know, very fast that you know um, the librarians or the research uh, officers are very much focused into the area of disciplines which they understood best but if they have to curate data from other discipline it becomes a bit um, difficult for them so we are now embarking on the second uh, phase of training and we were able to build uh, one platform uh, as a pilot project 
we actually connected eight repositories, five from the research universities in Malaysia and two from a government institution. The five research universities, uh, the oldest university in Malaysia, and you know they probably have the most data, uh, research data in Malaysia. And then uh, we have two uh, government uh, agencies. Uh, one is MOSTI and the other one is data.gov.my, where this um, MOSTI is uh, Malaysian, Malaysian Science Technology um, uh, ministry actually probably also have one of the most uh, uh, number of uh, research data pre, um, be particularly because they actually fund uh, research uh, in Malaysia one of the major funder in research of Malaysia so um, the open science uh, the national open science guideline now has been adopted into um, the national data science uh, data the national data sharing policy so, which is uh, actually um, approved by cabinet in uh, 2023. So now it's part of the national uh, data sharing part guideline. So uh, we now are happy to say that we actually have uh, open science, uh, you know, policy in Malaysia that actually helps us to move uh, the initiative um, uh, much better than you know when we don't have this policy. So this is what our platform looked like. Um, this is, uh, you know, when we launched it, uh, there were about 1,383 databases from the five, uh, from the, sorry, from the eight uh, data repositories that we have. It was launched in May, 2023. Uh, we now have uh, increased the number of uh, data sets uh, in, the, in, in the research, uh, in the platform. And, uh, you know, visitors can actually just uh, download, but, the land, uh, we have uh, these um, um, areas, we have about 10 areas that we actually look into, uh, uh, ask people to deposit data into. Uh, of course, medical uh, and health sciences. We have climate, uh, environment, biodiversity, energy, uh, physics, engineering, material science, computer science, information technology, telecommunication, agriculture, veterinary, uh, food, biological chemistry, uh, and uh, mathematical sciences. But we also um, wanted to actually capture the, the research that are being done by uh, our friends in the social science and humanities area. So we have special ones for them, which is language and education, art and social science, as well as business finances and economy. So it's arranged uh, in such a way that, you know, you can actually put in your data in which you uh, area that you feel, uh, you know, would be most uh, beneficial for people to share. We are actually in, in uh, uh, the second phase of the uh, Open Science Initiative. We are now looking also to include another area called Indigenous Knowledge and Citizen Science, which is why I'm quite happy to actually uh, come to this uh, meeting to hear about you know, the work that is being done, uh, especially by our friends uh, you know, that have actually uh, looked into Indigenous data uh, and how we can manage Indigenous data because um, we are uh, also have we are also having people working on uh, ind indigenous knowledge and particularly now um, uh, we are looking at the national plan planetary action plan for uh, you know Malaysia and that also involves a lot of indigenous knowledge that helps to um, maybe mitigate some of the uh, you know challenges that we face in terms of climate and uh, uh, biodiversity loss etc. So this is how we manage uh, our open science platform. Uh, the uh, platform at the uh, Academy of Sciences actually just hosts the metadata, but the raw data is actually hosted by the institution themselves. For example, if uh, the work research work is done uh, at the University of Malaya, the researchers can just uh, deposit their uh, research data, um, you know, into the uh, Malaysia University of Malaya uh, research. Uh, repository and each of these uh, repository would have their own data stewards that will manage it and you know look into the data to ensure that you know uh, whatever sensitive issues and all the other things are being taken care of before you know they actually uh, click it onto the Malaysian Open Science Platform. So Malaysian Open Science Platform is uh, perhaps the first uh, landing page for anybody who wants to go and actually find all this information uh, and then you know you'll be directed to the um, the different institution that host the research data. Um, this actually would uh, one of the way uh, that we were able to uh, convince you know some of the researchers to be 
you know, uh, to, to be involved in the open science, uh, also the institution, because they were worried, of course, about their security and, of course, about their data being, uh, you know, used without their permission, etc. So, uh, you know, the uh, academy uh, think that, you know, it's best for the uh, institution themselves to manage, uh, you know, this um, repository and the sharing. And each institution probably have their own uh, research uh, or open science policy that, uh, you know, uh, will also encourage their researchers to actually deposit and share their data in the repositories. So currently, as I mentioned earlier, we have eight. We are actually in this uh, particular uh, phase two, uh, adding about five more, um, you know, uh, repositories from our other institutions as well as agencies uh, such as the National Institute of Health uh, that actually have a very nice uh, repository already, uh, you know, but they need to actually now look into how to manage uh, confidential data. So we are also now embarking on uh, guidelines on health data as well as a guideline for biodiversity data, which we are talking about. So what do we see in MOSPI? As I mentioned earlier, this is the landing page. Uh, you can go in and actually see uh, whatever the research that has been done, we all uh, we have each of them have an identifier number, and you see the contributor in terms of in in such cases who who which institution is contributing the data and who the creator of the data is, and you can actually now get access to the data when you click um, data access, you will it will def, uh, immediately link you to the repository which is the University of Science Malaysia, and then you can see whether the data is open or. Or the data, or you, or the data is restricted, where you now need uh, permission from the uh, institution and the uh, researcher or the creator of the data to be able to access the data. We uh, one of the challenges uh, I think uh, our Korean uh, uh, you know uh, speaker just now mentioned uh, in open science is to actually get uh, you know researchers to share their data because uh, they were afraid that you know, the data will be used without their permission uh, and it will be open access and everybody can actually grab hold of the data. So we were able to um, uh, convince uh, most of our researchers that you know, the data that we share are not actually open access, but it uh, follows the FAIR principle uh, as well as the open, access, open, open science tagline of you know, it being as open as possible, but as close as necessary. So if you feel that, the, if they feel that the data is confidential and they need to close it, then the access to the data will be restricted and only the institution or the creator themselves will have, will have uh, you know, the authority to actually share. So you know, this is how we actually uh, manage to convince our, a lot of more of our data uh, researchers to actually uh, deposit their data. Now. So uh, how do we actually, uh, we at the moment we are struggling still trying to uh, uh, ensure that the data that was placed in um, the repository under the open science to be more of, uh, to follow more of the FAIR principle, findable and accessible are easy, but the interoperable, interoperability and the reusability is actually a little bit of a challenge because uh, the researchers will put it in a way that, uh, you know, that perhaps the data are not interoperable or the data is not reusable. So which is why we are embarking on the 2.0 um, uh, data stewardship to ensure that, you know, the data put in restricted or open would be interoperable and reusable, uh, you know, by other researchers for other purposes. Uh, we are happy that, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, that, we are now looking um, that we are talking uh, that in this in this uh, uh, meeting that we are actually looking at indigenous because our next um, you know uh, um, um, initiative would be to actually have an indigenous knowledge uh, database where you know we would like to actually uh, you know put in some of the knowledge that we have from our research uh, that is being done by you know uh, researchers whether it's in science or in uh, uh, you know, social science into the database so that it can be used for uh, you know, several purposes, but we need to actually ensure that you know, these data are uh, you know, actually being used properly and the, the rights of the indigenous people are being taken care of. So um, we are actually uh, hoping to, to do this next. Uh, but one of the things that we have done currently is the guideline on open biodiversity um, data, which uh, because we have many 
uh, researchers looking at biodiversity research and actually, uh, you know, uh, gathering a lot of data. So we need to have a proper guideline on how, uh, you know, biodiversity data is being put in. And then a guideline on health research data, which uh, actually is, uh, for us, is also very important because, uh, and I'm sure it's also important worldwide because, you know, a lot of this health uh, research data are actually confidential. So um, we do not want, uh, you know, uh, uh, data to just go in uh, when you know to to ensure the confi confidentiality and privacy of the the data uh, provider okay is 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 taken care of so um, apart from the so now apart from the national guideline for open science we would look, uh, we have these two guidelines that we are going to hopefully incorporate into the uh, policy and then we would like to look at uh, research domain on indigenous data knowledge uh, indigenous knowledge and have the indigenous data governance and policy uh, and guideline and policy in place, hopefully. And one of the uh, thing that, uh, you know, we are happy to actually have uh, currently is, uh, you know, from the Open Science Initiative, we are, op uh, we are actually hoping to move into open innovation, which, uh, you know, we have another initiative called iConnect, which actually look at, uh, you know, uh, using the data that we have, uh, the research data that we have uh, in the Open Science uh, platform to be able to innovate uh, and, and come up with new innovation or, or technology, uh, indigenous technology, especially Malaysian technology, uh, because then, you know, the data uh, from the scientists or the researchers now are available for sharing. Previously, it's not very easy because for, for you know, uh, industry to actually, uh, you know, come out, uh, look at the data, they, they, they don't know where to go and they have to move all over the places uh, individually to find, you know, some of the data to be able to, you know, maybe innovate or you look at, you know, their, their uh, uh, activities in order to see whether, you know, it suits the industry. But with open science, uh, you know, we're able to actually now be, uh, uh, connect some of the industries. We have currently about three or four industries already in some of the project that involve, uh, you know, using uh, the data within open science uh, to actually do some innovation through the iConnect, uh, you know, program. So um, I think uh, that's uh, where we are at the moment. And thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ahmad. Um, so we have had uh, uh, an overview of the, the care principles and some of the projects that are, that are being worked on uh, through the University of Arizona. Uh, we've had three presentations on different approaches to open science uh, in Korea, in Japan, and in Malaysia. Uh, and we now move to the uh, the question time. Um, does anyone have a question they would like to ask the panelists? I think given the number of people, it's probably easiest if you just use the Zoom function to raise your hand, and uh, I will call on you. Uh, Francoise, I suspected your face might mean that you had a question. Please go ahead. Yes, it's another way to show up. So I, I think you know, I am always. Thank you very much for the presentations. It's always very interesting, and every time we are in the RDA, we we see communalities and differences in initiatives, and I have the impression that we could have a look at the Gork model. For those who don't know, GORC is Global Open uh, Research Commons to try to map uh, the, the communalities and the differences and to learn from them. So it's something, it can be a work for the future, but it's what I think when I hear all these very interesting things. And to understand how the care principles can be maybe not mapped but uh, linked to the to the Gork model or reciprocally could be also very interesting. Uh, do, do, would any one of the speakers like to respond to that? I'm just Maybe that would be a question for you, Andrew. You know the Gork model. Yeah, and no, I'm I'm digging out the link even as we speak. Um, I'm trying to avoid linking to something on my own personal website and uh, going for something that, uh, that's on the RDA website, but it, the functionality is still being built. Okay, so maybe that's a comment for me. I, I will take that as a comment for me, Francoise. Thank you. Um, Tom. 
Well, you can respond to that comment if you want uh, before I ask I, I, a question. I, 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 I could respond. Uh, I guess my response would be that the question of the how to how to adopt the care principles within an open research commons is one that at the moment we would fit within uh, the rules of participation and access. But I note the comment from Mikiko that uh, we should probably also be thinking of it within the context of data management and data governance. So maybe maybe I'm going to to take the easy way out here and say it's a really interesting idea and I need to go away and think about it. Yeah, so my question uh, also dovetails with that, uh, but it was for Riley. Um, so, uh, but Mikiko, uh, perhaps you want to uh, respond <laughs> first. Thank you, Tom. I couldn't find a hand to raise <laughs> on my Zoom. Um, the, what, what, I, what I would like to learn for myself too, throughout the uh, discussion of GORC GOG and the FAIR principles, etc., what it would be the uniqueness or uh, requirement to describe the data or profiles of uh, research itself in addition to the open science discussion we have had up to today, what would it be? Like, I understand that uh, individual information, for example, uh, but also that that is also discussed in medical firm or as I introduced already today, the biodiversity. Um, it, are there any uniqueness because of indigenous research data? Is my question to perhaps to everyone who knows better than I do. So Tom, are you happy for me to, to get Riley to respond to that and then you can ask your question? So Riley, what's unique about indigenous data? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, I think for us, the way we think about indigenous data sovereignty is really grounded in indigenous people's rights over mm -hmm. their data, over the use of their data. Um, is kind of how I'd answer that question. So thinking about, you know, the specific relationships and uh, protocols Indigenous peoples have for the governance of their own data, uh, like I said earlier, sort of the heart of the care principles and the heart of thinking about, you know, what kinds of structures, um, what kinds of, you know, including technical infrastructures need to be in place to uphold Indigenous peoples' rights. I think that's kind of the high level answer of what's unique. And then what's also unique is that, you know, indigenous peoples make up some 476 million people around the world. Um, so you have just a tremendous diversity in the kinds of relationships, the kinds of, you know, roles and responsibilities those peoples carry in, in relationship to their data. So um, it's also highly context dependent. So we always think about you know, care provides guidance for people interacting with indigenous data at this sort of broad level. But ideally it's always pointing you home to the specific protocols of the indigenous people um, who relate to data in a given project or data ecosystem. And so, you know, we always really with the kind of our piece of care uh, responsibility and the kind of relationships that that encompasses, um, always encourage as much as possible direct partnership with the specific communities, tribes, nations, um, whose data, the governance of whose data is sort of in question, right? Because care can kind of give you that high level insight. And then those particular communities are the ones who need to be kind of um, communicating, you know, the considerations mm -hmm. that need to be in place for the, the privacy or protection of their data. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and if I can add uh, an approach that I found useful as a way of thinking about how you might capture some of those Indigenous data concerns at the, the individual repository record level, um, mm -hmm. traditional knowledge labels, sometimes called TK labels. I posted a link in chat to those. Um, they're a way of augmenting your metadata records uh, with uh, information 
that's grounded in Indigenous community practice uh, and developed by a range of Indigenous groups. So that's that's a possible approach that you might want to look at, Makiko. Anyway, yeah. sorry, all of that, Tom, was before we got to your question. Uh, yeah, so I was, I was kind of, uh, you had a slide, Riley, that uh, sort of broke down activity in terms of, you know, a global effort, a regional effort, and a, a nation level effort. And it struck me that um, some of the activity that you're talking about is really on the, um, uh, is on the community side, um, in terms of like, where we're seeing those protocols emerge from. Um, the work that we're doing with the Indigenous Data Network um, here in Australia is we seem to be in a phase of developing Indigenous data governance frameworks, um, but the uh, the the home of those frameworks really it's coming from the data holding side, mm -hmm. where they're going through a process of laying out um, what they're committing to in terms of realizing Indigenous data governance. Um, and of course, in doing that, they're uh, consulting heavily. They're trying to in, uh, ensure that these activities are indigenous led, uh, that they are um, they consult widely, that they um, are not just declaring how they're going to do it, and um, uh, and so on. I, I'm curious about your reaction to the the kind of the locus of the energy, whether um, whether you see it playing out as a, a kind of nation led uh declaration of protocols and appropriate behaviors which would then apply to a large number of institutions or where you see the position of institutional positions on this that then would actually in many cases apply to a great many uh nations or communities um as well like there's a there's a weird kind of da dance going on there yeah yeah definitely thank you tom that's a really excellent question and i think the short answer for me is that, you know, everybody who is interacting with Indigenous data carries responsibilities to upholding Indigenous data sovereignty. So I think it's kind of a, a both and with, you know, um, where that energy or effort needs to be coming from. So a lot of the work that we do is similar to what you're describing and that is sort of targeting, um, you know, non-Indigenous entities, whether it's data repositories or federal or governmental agencies at the level of the nation state, um, universities and so on. And that's because there's a lot of work yet to be done, especially in the United States, um, to get, you know, institutionalization of indigenous data governance and to even, um, you know, have these institutions recognize those responsibilities. And so there's definitely a need for uh, the kind of the scaffolding of that responsibility across all of these sites. And um, yeah, precisely as you kind of paraphrased from some of the things I've shared, you know, the details and the specifics of those protocols need to be coming from Indigenous peoples. And then ultimately the authority, um, you know, for IDSOV lies within Indigenous peoples uh, as political collectives. So um, so hopefully everybody is is supported and is active in contributing to that movement. And I think there's also something that we're starting to try and think more about with the care data maturity model is, you know, what are the responsibilities that institutions also carry to support the capacity building so that tribes, nations, indigenous communities um, have access to resources to, you know, build up their own infrastructure for data storage or, you know, supporting their own uh, indigenous led data collection projects and also even just being able to articulate um, what Indigenous data sovereignty and governance looks like sort of in their own language and, and on their own terms. So, so yeah, and in short, hopefully it's, you know, everybody's responsibility. And um, we're always really encouraged to see both the grassroots Indigenous data sovereignty movements led by Indigenous peoples and, um, you know, the mobilization across federal governmental agencies and, and other non-Indigenous entities too. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Veronica Stoker. Stoker, I'm not sure. Uh, apologies if I've mangled your surname. Um, asking whether, and this is, I think, for all three of the presenters, uh, sorry, all three of the um, open science platform presenters, 
asking whether the data in the repositories, is that restricted to the countries where the data was generated? Or is that data accessible worldwide? So perhaps if we could have uh, an answer from uh, Korea, uh, Korea, Japan, and Malaysia on that question. So is the data only available within your country or is it available uh, worldwide? Um, let me see, we have Makiko and... Uh, okay, um, so let's let's do it in the order in which the, the presentations occurred. Uh, so for Korea, is the... Is the data stored in data on only available in Korea or available worldwide? Uh, uh, data on service uh, is to uh, serve all, all of them, but the uh, main target users uh, is uh, Korean people. So the uh, sites is uh, written by Korean. Uh, mainly, and we also explain some uh, uh, explanation of the data on in English, but the target users uh, is uh, Korean people. Uh, and uh, in another way, uh, we develop and distribute some data repository, uh, NARDA, an uh, institutional data repository. Uh, some institutions have uh, operate by in uh, their own uh, local sites, not uh, open the uh, websites because some security issues and mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So, so for for the for for this case, we only connected to uh, these sites to our sites. Uh, yes, a uh, secure channel. Uh, yeah, this. This uh, our case. <laughs> okay, so, thank you very much for that. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Um, uh, Mikiko, uh, in Japan, is that uh, accessible outside Japan? Although I note uh, Jungho's comments about uh, the challenges for English speakers of navigating perhaps the interface. <laughs> That's another challenge. In short, uh, the. Most of the institution repositories are open to the world, no matter where the data was created. However, there is a, a choice of uh, repository, so-called uh, limited, or oh, sorry, controlled access repository. Mm. This does mean to the control to the people who wish to use to access to the research data, because yeah. some cases the research domain people wants to close close uh, work, not do, do not want to, just they don't are not ready to open. So that for the time being, for the research itself is active, they want to close, but want yeah. to share with mostly publicly in the future. And the second one, limited to the Maoji language, we, we do our best to provide uh, both languages, English and Japanese and hoping to the long-term future, we don't need to do any more so that the AI would do for us. Yep, thank you. And I should be clear, I wasn't suggesting that uh, countries should necessarily provide uh, interfaces in English. I I feel slightly embarrassed that, uh, that English has become the default. Uh, um, and obviously countries should feel entirely comfortable with uh, using whatever language is, is appropriate for them. Uh, Malaysia. Um, yeah, um, the data from Malaysia is actually accessible worldwide. You just need to go into the platform and actually, uh, you know, um, get the data if it's uh, not restricted or closed. Um, the metadata are all in English, so it's easier for people to understand what's going on. And then, uh, you know, you may actually now go into uh, the individual repository or institutional repository to get the data. It may be in um, uh, Malay, in the local language, but um, yeah. most of the time it is in English. Um, and um, if it's restricted or closed, then uh, you know you can actually contact the institution or the owner and it's up to them to actually um, allow you to use or give you permission uh, to actually get all of the data. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Yasuhiro. Sorry, yeah, Mariana. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. 
All right. Uh, yes. I have two questions, and one is a simple one for clarification that uh, I assume there are many Asian participants there and uh, non-native English speakers, and uh, uh, for instance, sovereignty is not easy to understand for the non-native English speakers, I think, and I have read uh, the, this word in the context of the care principle and the indigenous data, and but uh, your speaking about the business uh, sovereignty, et cetera. So sovereignty itself is uh, kind of the right to organize and govern their own data or their own uh, property. Is it right understanding? Uh, so Riley, perhaps if you would like to respond to this, you are as the expert in this area. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, when we're thinking about um, a sovereignty and we're kind of invoking the language of some of these international mechanisms like the United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People. So so certainly thinking about Indigenous peoples as um, sovereign political collectives, um, in particular because Indigenous peoples may be you know, living within um, colonial nations or nation states. Um, but still have you know sovereignty to govern uh, and self determine um, how their lands and territories are used and how they preserve their culture. So yeah, sovereignty you can think of as, as determination um, and kind of yeah carrying different uh, meanings in different political contexts. But like for example, in the U.S., we recognize that you know there are um, hundreds of sovereign tribal nations. Um, and actually many more who lack federal recognition but are still considered sovereign. Mm. So is it usually used in a so cultural context, right? Cultural yeah. and political context, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, yeah. people identify culturally um, as shared collectives, but the sovereignty really gets at, I would say, the, the political authority those people have um, mm. as collectives. Thank you very and, much. And yeah. a degree of agency as well, perhaps? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, mm -hmm. Amuri Amasan, you had a second question? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. I have a question for infrastructure people. Uh, that's in, uh, as you know, the uh, general infrastructure uh, is um, sometimes shows a very good, uh, beautiful pictures for governing their, the country data. But uh, in reality, you know, the uh, space science people or earthquake people or health science people, uh, they have their own way to analyze data, their own way to uh, curate the data. And uh, it's just so one size uh, may not be, uh, be easy to fit to uh, everything, uh, as you know. So the, you, I would like to ask you, may, if you may have any trial or uh, prototyping project uh, or something for or specific domain data project or something, or you are trying to uh, cover the very wide range of the disciplines uh, for the infrastructure. Okay, so the question is about the, if you like the tension between domain specific infrastructures and more general infrastructures. And uh, before I ask which of my speakers would like to, to respond to that, I should say that uh, the approach that we're adopting in Australia with the Australian Research Data Commons is we have three domain specific infrastructures, uh, one looking at health and medical, one looking at earth and environment, and the one that Tom is the solution architect for looking at humanities, arts, social sciences, and indigenous. So, so we're deliberately trying to build solutions for three particular domain groups there. But I wonder whether uh, our Korean, Japanese or Malaysian speakers would like to talk about what they're proposing to do um, to deal with discipline specific infrastructures as opposed to general mm -hmm. infrastructures. Um, can I respond to that? Yeah, please. Yeah, in Malaysia, we're actually looking into that uh, specific domains. Um, although, you know, if you look at, you know, the areas that we actually put in, most people are about 10, right? But uh, currently, we are actually uh, focusing on uh, two domains. Um, one is the health, uh, with the help of our um, National Institute of Health. They've already had 
uh, you know, their specific infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, there. So, you know, any of the health uh, research that will follow the guideline that is being set up by the health, um, National Institute of Health Research and Infrastructure will actually look into how they actually uh, manage their, their data because they have actually gone way ahead of uh, the Malaysian Open Science, uh, you know, in terms of their governance, data governance and infrastructure. The second one that we are actually uh, looking into, uh, which is a specific focus for one of our, uh, you know, area and showcase for an open science uh, specific domain is biodiversity. We are working with um, our national research, uh, the Ministry of Research, uh, you know, um, and actually looking at uh, the the Forest Research uh, Research uh, Institute and looking at their infrastructure, um, which is a start of uh, what we uh, of a. a um, you know, a database or repository and infrastructure called uh, MyBIS, uh, which actually subsequently will be uh, something mirroring um, GB. I don't know if you, uh, you know, are aware of this. Yeah. So those two areas are the ones that we are actually currently focusing on in our second uh, initiative before we move mm -hmm. into, you know, the other domains. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, GBIF is the Global Biodiversity Information Framework for people who haven't seen that acronym before. Uh, Mikiko or Jung Ho, did you want to add oh, to, to that? Oh, we have some projects, and one of them is a pre illness research projects. The specific purpose for prevention from the future illness, and ah. uh, the the reason is a quite good mixture of type of data, and uh, also uh, need to work with uh, analysis. So it's a really data-driven type of science, as an example mm. of the case that you ask. Great. Okay, thank you. Well, we are at time. Um, my thanks to uh, all four speakers for their uh, time and care they took in preparing their presentations and for the very interesting views they've provided of uh, the care principles and uh, three national approaches to open science infrastructures. Um, it's I, I've learned a lot. It's been very, uh, very interesting. And uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, there are collaborative notes. Let me see if I can paste them in again. No, that's not what I want. Uh, there are collaborative notes linked from Hoover. Um, so please, if you would like to add to those, uh, if the speakers have their slides available online and could link them into the collaborative notes, that would also be great. Uh, and uh, I wish all of you a very interesting and enjoyable rest of this particular virtual plenary. Um, thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. 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 Bye.